this session is going to be on fault tolerant distributed con consensus and uh, the speaker is Ashish. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ashish to, uh, to the world. He is an assistant associate professor at uh, IIIT Bangalore. But to me, he's a great friend, long time uh, collaborator and one of the reasons for me being in, in academia. Um, thank you. <laughs> and uh, uh, he is extremely passionate about uh, teaching and, uh, and uh, reading, uh, and then crazy about Byzantine agreements and consensus. The secret follower of, of Danny Dolev and uh, Juan Garay, of course, Juan doesn't know, and I don't think he's here, and uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. And he's, yes, he's going to talk, uh, talk, you, talk about uh, fault tolerant distributed consensus. So consensus or Byzantine agreement and MPC are married long back in, from 1980s. A lot of results from uh, the domain of consensus ha have implication in the MPC domain and other way around. And uh, uh, yeah, so they have a lot of connections. Uh, Byzantine agreement is contributing to uh, the, the foundations of MPC. So in this talk, he's going to cover a big landscape for last 40 years of, or so about the, um, on this problem. Yeah, so over to you. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, Arpita, for the kind introduction. Can you hear me at the back? Okay. So <clears throat> I would like to acknowledge uh, uh, B. Lassia, my former master student, who is right now doing PhD at Rochester with Muttu for the, some of the slides that I will be using in this presentation. And I have divided the talk into two parts. Part one will be very basic, fundamental, where I will be explaining what's the problem of Byzantine agreement, uh, its application, some known results. And part two will be slightly technical, where I will talk about uh, randomized Byzantine agreement. Specifically, I will talk about the classical framework of Rabin and Benor, how to use common coin to design Byzant randomized Byzantine agreement in the asynchronous setting. And we will see how to instantiate the framework using a very fundamental primitive in a distributed computing, namely verifiable secret sharing. <clears throat> so let's begin with the problem description. So this is called as the Byzantine generals problem introduced by Lamport et al. in 1982. So Lamport is a Turing Award winner. <clears throat> so consider the following problem. So we have the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so those who don't know what's Byzantine Empire, it's the ancient name of Roman Empire. And imagine that the empire or the city is surrounded by the enemy troop. So there are N troops controlled by N generals. And the generals have the mechanism to talk to each other. So you can imagine that they can exchange emails or they have some sort of uh, communication mechanism. And <clears throat> each general has a private plan either to attack the city or not to attack the city. So you can imagine that the private inputs of the generals is a bit, bit zero means not to attack, bit one means to attack. And it's also known that up to T of the generals may be traitor, but the exact identity of the traitors are not known. And what we want here is we want a mechanism or a protocol according to which the generals should talk to each other, exchange messages with each other so that finally they should, so, so that finally all the good generals should have a common action plan because the maximum damage can happen only when all the good generals are on the same page. So remember, so here the goal of the T bad generals will be to basically ensure that two good generals are on different page. So if this exactly is the problem description, then it's very trivial to solve because everyone can come up with a default action, let's all attack or let's all retreat. So the problem in its current form is not interesting to solve. What makes the problem more interesting to solve is that we also want that the final output of the good generals should be the input of the good generals if all the good generals started with the same input. That means to begin with all the good generals had the common action plan, then we want that the agreement should not be distorted and that should be the final output. And that makes the problem description very interesting because even without knowing the inputs of the generals to begin with, we need that finally the output should be the out input of the good generals if all of them had the same input. And that makes the problem non-trivial. <clears throat> So we are computer science community. We need a computer science abstraction of this problem. So the computer science abstraction is the following. Say we have n servers or n computers. Up to t of them could be bad. And each server has some message. And what we want here is a distributed protocol which should allow the 
good servers or the good parties to have a common output. So the M1, M2, M3 are the inputs of the parties. One of the requirements from the protocol that we are interested to design is that at the end of the protocol all the good parties or the good server should have a common output. So this is the agreement property. And we also need a validity property which requires that if all the good servers had the same input then that should be the final output. <clears throat> so what are the applications of Byzantine agreement problem in the context of MPC? So uh, it, very often in the MPC protocols we come across a scenario where a party needs to send some message identically to all the parties. But if the sender is a bad party it may send up different versions of the message to different parties so there we need an instance of agreement protocol. And this is also, uh, th this problem is also very relevant in the context of state machine replication or distributed databases. So for instance, if you consider a distributed database where the same copy of the database is replicated across multiple locations and imagine that the database is a dynamic database where the transactions are keep on happening and say a number of transactions are floating around in the system so that the the different copies of the database get updated and after every update basically you need an instance of agreement protocol to ensure that all the good copies or the, or the good replications are consistent with each other. That means it should not happen that one copy of the database has one version and another copy of the database has another version. Even and you need to ensure this even in the presence of up to t bat corruptions which can happen in the system. Right? So this is what basically a blockchain protocol does. So you can imagine a distributed database as an instance of blockchain and you have n copies of the blockchain available and after every update of the blockchain across multiple locations you need an instance of agreement protocol to be executed to ensure that all the good copies are on the same page. So that, that shows that this problem has got uh, lots of practical applications. So let me tell you uh, a brief landscape of the Byzantine agreement problem because this is one of the fundamental problems studied by both the distributed computing community as well as the crypto community and if you see over the last 3-4 decades, if you see any top venue in theoretical computer science like JSCM, POTC, Stock, Fox, you will find plenty of papers related to this topic being published and this problem can be studied in varieties of settings. So, so we can basically classify Byzantine agreement problem depending upon the level of synchronization that is available to the participants, the type of faults which can be there in the system, whether we are studying the problem in the presence of a setup, what kind of channels are available to the participants and so on. And as we go down in this hierarchy, the description of the, the, pro, the, the nature of the problem becomes more and more challenging and difficult. So if we consider the level of synchronization, Remember we are talking about a distributed protocol, so what kind of channels are available to the parties? So one very simplistic setting is when we assume that the parties are connected in a synchronous network and they are synchronized by a global clock, that is the most simplest form of synchronization you can assume or we can go extreme to the other extreme and assume that the network is completely asynchronous where there is no global clock among the participants. So that is one way of characterizing the problem. There could be different types of faults in the system. So the simplest form of faults which can happen is the crash fault where we assume that up to t parties can crash at any time during the execution of the protocol but as long as they are alive they honestly follow the protocol instruction. But once a system is crashed it crashes for the rest of the protocol execution. So that is a simple form of corruption but a more uh, Stronger form of the corruption is the malicious corruption or the Byzantine corruption where we assume that the T bat parties can deviate from the protocol instruction in whatever form they want. We can st study the problem depending upon whether any kind of setup is available. So when I say a PKI setup we assume that to begin with the parties know a public key of each participant of the system and the corresponding secret key is available with the respective party. So that is a PKI setup. But we can also study the problem uh, in a scenario where no kind of system is available and the only mechanism that is available to the parties is a way to talk to each other in an authentic fashion. And type of channels, so simple, simple model could be where we assume we have private channels among each pair of participant whereas we can also study the problem where we do not have any kind of such point to point secure channel among the participants. This model is also called as the broadcast model where all the communications happen in the public mode. <coughs> so, uh, 
So, what are the known results in the synchronous setting? So, the problem was initially formulated in the synchronous setting. So, synchronous setting is very simple to work with. Here we assume that all the parties are synchronized by a global clock. And when I say global clock, that means everyone knows the maximum delay that is there in the system. That means whenever I send a message, I know within this much time delta, the message will go to the receiving end. right? So, in this model, the protocol basically operates as a sequence of rounds, where each round has a delay of delta. So, if I say I have an R round protocol, a round is nothing but I do some computation, calculate some message as per the protocol and then send it to my neighbors. And by the beginning of the next round, I receive all the messages that my neighbor has sent in the previous round. So, the protocol operates as a strict sequence of rounds in the synchronous setting and this is very simple to work with. And the advantage in this model is that if I am a receiver and as per the protocol, I am expecting some message from a sender, I know how much time I have to wait for that message. Say delta is one hour, then I know that within one hour that message should come to me if my sender counterpart is following the protocol instructions correctly. But if the sender is corrupt and does not send a message within that time frame delta, then I know definitely the sender is corrupt and I can throw him off from the rest of the protocol execution. So, that is a property of synchronous model. So, it is known that uh, the Byzantine agreement problem in the synchronous setting is possible only if you have less than n over 2 corruptions. So, the maximum number of faults which can which should be there in the system should be at most 49 percent. And intuitively you can understand it as follows, if more if half of the people are corrupt, then it is impossible for the remaining 50 percent good people to agree on the same output. So, trivially T less than n by 2 is a necessary bound for any kind of Byzantine agreement protocol. And in a classical work in 1983, Dolev and Strong showed how to design a Byzantine agreement protocol with uh, tolerating T less than n over 2 corruptions assuming a PKI setup is available. So, assuming uh, signature keys are available, a signature setup is available among the participants, the Dolev Strong protocol is a very simple protocol to achieve agreement tolerating up to 49 percent corruption. It is also known that if no kind, if no setup is available among the participants, that means only point to point channels are available among the participants, then you can design Byzantine agreement protocol only if there are up to 33 percent corruption in the system. You cannot tolerate more than n over 3 corruptions. And uh, the original work by Lempert et al also show how to design inefficient protocols. Basically, they give a uh, very simple protocol which is called as EIG protocol, exponential information gathering protocol, uh, which solves the problem of Byzantine agreement tolerating up to n over 3 corruptions. But the protocol was inefficient because it performs exponential amount of computation. Later in a sequence of work by Berman et al and Greyer et al, uh, efficient protocols were proposed for uh, polytime Byzantine agreement problem and we have now efficient protocols. So, these are the results in the synchronous setting. So, now let us go to the asynchronous model and asynchronous model is more practical compared to the synchronous model because the basic characteristic of the asynchronous model is that we do not assume that the parties are synchronized by a global clock. That means, we do not know when exactly my message is going to be the going to be delivered to the receiver. I assume no such upper bound on the message delivery. right? But at the same time, uh, as soon as we go to the asynchronous model and we assume that parties just have local clocks which are not synchronized, we come, we face this dilemma that if I am a receiver, I do not know how long I have to wait for a message which I am expecting from the sender. Should I wait for one hour, one day, one week, one year, I do not know because I do not know how long it is going to take for the message that my sender has sent to me to receive, within how much time I will be able to receive that. That means, I cannot make a distinction between a slow sender who has sent a message, but it got delayed in the network and a bad sender who has not, who has purposely not sent a message to me. And this is like, uh, this is unlike the synchronous model because in the synchronous model, you know that within time frame delta, you should have received the message. And if you do not receive the message within delta, you can throw away that party. But that you cannot do in the asynchronous model because it might be the case that the message was actually coming, it was on the way, but you did not wait it for sufficient amount of time. In general, if we are designing an asynchronous protocol in the presence of T corruption, then at every step of the protocol, a party can afford to receive communication from maximum n minus T parties. 
and as soon as it receives communication from n minus t parties, it has to go to the next step of the computation. It cannot wait for all the n messages to come and then go to the next step of the computation because that will result to an endless waiting. But in this process, what is happening is that you are actually ignoring communication from t potentially honest parties, right? And a set of t messages which you are ignoring may belong to honest parties. And worse, what can happen is that in different stages of the different round, different uh, steps of the protocol, you will be ignoring communication from t different set, from different sets of t parties. So it won't be the case that a set of t parties whom you have ignored for step one will be the same for step two, will be same for step three, and so on, because you don't know which set of n minus t messages you are going to receive. That's an inherent uh, difficulty that we always face while designing an asynchronous protocol, and you can never get rid of this phenomena. And the main bottleneck in the asynchronous model is that the network itself is actually the adversary because we assume that the whole scheduling mechanism is under the control of the adversary and adversary can schedule messages in whatever form it wants, right? So even though asynchronous model is more realistic because at the end of the day you will be deploying your protocol over the internet and internet by default is asynchronous in nature. You can't make strict assumptions that within this much time your internet uh, connection is going to deliver messages to respective parties. So even though we want asynchronous protocols, designing asynchronous, fully asynchronous protocols is a very, very challenging task. So let us now redefine the problem of uh, Byzantine agreement in the asynchronous setting. We still have a set of n parties with their private inputs. We want a protocol so that at the end of the protocol, all the good parties should have a common output. We also need the validity property. That means if all the good parties started with a common input, that should be the final output. But now we need, we need a new property in the, asynchronous pro, in the asynchronous model, namely the termination property. And what the termination property demands is that if all the honest parties participate in the protocol, then eventually all the honest parties should terminate. But we never put any kind of upper bound that by this much time they should terminate because we do not have the notion of a global clock. We do not need explicitly the termination guarantee in the synchronous model because by default synchronous model if it is an R round protocol and if the global delay is delta, we know that by time R times delta the protocol will terminate. But we do not have a notion of global clock in the asynchronous model. So that is why we explicitly require a termination condition where we demand that eventually all the good parties should terminate. Right? When exactly that happens, we can make no estimate whatsoever. So this is now a new requirement for asynchronous agreement protocols. So let's see what are the known results in the asynchronous model. So it's known that irrespective of whether any kind of setup is available in the asynchronous world, you can tolerate only up to 33% corruption. That means it doesn't matter if you are given signature setup or not, you can only tolerate up to 33% corruption. And this is very kind of uh, interesting because in the synchronous setting, we know that the cryptographic setting and the information theoretic setting, they are separate, separable in the sense, if we are given a PKI setup in the synchronous model, we can tolerate all the way to 49% corruption and no setup, we can tolerate up to 33% corruption. But in the asynchronous model, irrespective of any setup is there or not, you can only tolerate 33% corruption. And not only that, there is a very classic fundamental result in the distributed commu uh, computing community. It is also called as the FLP impossibility result uh, uh, due to Fisher, Lynch and Patterson who actually warned the system people not to try to design asynchronous agreement protocols. Basically, they are, in simple words, their impossibility result is that no deterministic agreement protocol in the asynchronous world will give you agreement in the sense it will never terminate. That means even if there is single corruption in the system and that single corruption just could be as simple as a fault corruption, it need not be a Byzantine corruption. Even if there is one fault in the system, you can never design a protocol which ensures that all the good parties obtain their output. That means the protocol will always be an ever, run, ever running protocol. So you can never design a deterministic protocol in the asynchronous setting which satisfies the termination property. And this is a very celebrated result in the distributed computing community. So now the question is, we want to design agreement protocols in the asynchronous world because that's practical. But at the same time, we have this classical FLP impossibility result which warns us to design 
asynchronous deterministic protocols because we can never achieve termination property. So does that mean that we get the end of the asynchronous agreement? Can't we design asynchronous agreement protocol? Well, the answer is no because if you see the FLP impossibility result is against the deterministic agreement protocols. And a very common approach to avoid this FLP impossibility result is to embrace randomness and uh, this approach of embracing randomness in the context of asynchronous agreement protocols is attributed independently to uh, Benor and Rebin who simultaneously proposed this framework and they gave a notion of randomized asynchronous agreement protocols and you get two different flavors of randomized agreement protocols in the asynchronous setting. One minus lambda terminating means except with probability lambda where lambda is some non-zero uh, parameter which you can control all the good parties will eventually terminate the protocol. Whereas you have another category of uh, randomized ABA protocols namely almost surely terminating protocols which gives you the guarantee that all honest parties eventually terminate the protocol with probability 1. Now <clears throat> this is a very subtle thing here when I say that a protocol terminates with probability 1 that does not mean it always terminates. What I mean here is that if you keep on running the protocol for infinity asymptotically it will terminate with probability 1. So to make my point more clear let us see the difference between uh, 1 minus lambda terminating protocol versus almost surely terminating protocol in, in the context of randomized uh, protocols. So imagine this is a very simple do while loop. Inside the while loop I am tossing a fair coin which throws 0 and 1 with probability 1 over 2 and my termination condition is that I should stop this loop when I get b equal to 0. So now if I keep on running this loop so for k iteration what is the probability that even after this k, uh, k iterations the loop does not terminate uh, it is 1 over 2 raised to power k because even after k iteration if in each of these k iterations you obtain 1 you will not terminate the loop. That means I can say that the probability that the loop terminates after k iterations is definitely 1 minus 1 over 2 raised to power k that means I can say that asymptotically or limit k tending to 0, uh, k tending to infinity definitely with probability 1 this loop will terminate. In that sense this loop is almost surely terminating. So that means if I keep on running this loop forever definitely I will terminate that means it will not happen for infinity that I always keep on getting 1. But that does not mean it will always terminate. In that sense this is almost surely terminating and the expected number of iterations in which this loop will terminate is 2. That means after running this iteration for 2 iterations in expectation you hope that the loop will terminate. So this is an example of an almost surely terminating algorithm. On the other hand consider the same do while loop where my terminating condition is that I should terminate as soon as I obtain b equal to 0 but suppose inside a loop I also wait for some event e to occur and then only I go to the condition whether b is equal to 0 or not. Now what I can say is that if in each iteration the event e occurs this is as good as an almost surely terminating loop right and I can say that condition on the event that event e occurs in each iteration this, uh, this second uh, do while loop will terminate in expected two iterations. But what can happen is that if in some iteration the event e does not happen then I'm, I cannot go to the next iteration. And say if there is a lambda probability that event e does not occur in a particular iteration I cannot go to the next iteration in that sense the second do while loop is an example of 1 minus lambda terminating uh, do while loop whereas the first, first uh, do while loop is an example of a almost surely terminating do while loop. So even though if I say that protocol terminates with probability 1 that does not mean it always terminate I, by that I mean asymptotically if you keep on running the protocol it will eventually terminate. So that is the fundamental difference between almost surely terminating and 1 minus lambda terminating. So <clears throat> uh, before going further let me give you a feel of why t less than n over 3 condition is necessary for asynchronous Byzantine agreement problem. So remember my goal is to design an ABA protocol which should solve which should give me the validity guarantee as well as the agreement guarantee and on and I want to prove a theorem stating that assuming only point to point channels are available among the participants you cannot design ABA protocol tolerating less than or cannot tolerate you cannot design an ABA protocol tolerating more than n over 3 corruptions and I prove it by contradiction. 
So, assume on contrary you have some arbitrary protocol say pi which can solve the Byzantine agreement problem in the asynchronous setting with say n equal to 3t parties. Right? We want to prove that no such protocol pi is there, but for the sake of contradiction assume you have such a protocol. Now what I am going to do is I am going to consider three different executions of the protocol pi and I will come to the contradiction that definitely some property is not achievable by the protocol pi which goes against my assumption that I have a protocol pi. So consider the first possible execution of the protocol pi and remember I have 3T parties in the system because I am assuming that my protocol pi operates with 3T parties and I am partitioning the parties into three groups, each group consisting of T participants. And remember we are in the asynchronous model where adversary is the scheduler, it has the full capability of scheduling the messages in the system. So suppose in this execution the participants in the group C1 and the participants in the group C2, they are honest right? and all of them have input 0 and the participants in the group C3, they are the bad guys. They, that's a bad group of T people and say the adversary is scheduling the messages in such a way that the messages from C3 are not at all going to C2. Basically adversary decide that I am not going to communicate to the group C2 and nor I am going to communicate to the group C1. That's the strategy of the adversary in this execution. Now as for the protocol, the participants in group C1, they are only receiving communication within themselves and from the group C2 and they will be basing their actions only on the messages that they receive from the participants in C1 and from the participants in C2 and vice versa. So basically this, this group of participants are they are not at all communicating anything in the protocol. So now depending upon the steps of the protocol that are there in pi, we know that if at all the put participants in C2 terminate, they will terminate with an output 0 because this comes from your validity property. The validity property of pi says that if all the honest participants have the same input, then that should be the final output. And in this execution, the participants in C1 and the participants in C2 are the honest one. Their inputs are 0, so they should output only 0 as the output. Remember, I am not making any assumption about the steps of pi. It's an abstract protocol of certain number of steps. Now consider another execution which will be similar to this execution where the participants in C2 are bad, right? So remember when we are designing a protocol, we make no assumption that which group of participants will be bad. We know that only T of them could be bad. So in the second execution, the participants in C2 are the bad ones and their strategy is that they are not at all going to communicate to the parties in C1 group and C3 group. And say in this execution the inputs of the participants in C1 is 1 and the inputs of the participants in C3 is 1. That means only an adversary is scheduling the messages that only communication among the parties in C1 group and C3 group is happening. The group in C2 they are not at all responding at all. Now again what we can say is that if pi is indeed a valid protocol then as per the protocol pi the participants in C1 and C3 should terminate with output 1 because that follows from the validity property because in this execution the participants in C1 and the participants in C3 are the honest one and their inputs are same to begin with and that should be the final output. Now what we are going to do is we are going to compose these two executions and we will show another execution where some property of pi will be uh, violated and in this execution it's a group C1 who is going to be corrupted. That adversary decides that I am going to control the set of T participants in C1 and say in this execution the inputs of all the participants in C2 are 0 and the inputs of all the participants in C3 is 1. And adversary's strategy is the following. It somehow delays all the messages that are going to be exchanged between C2 and C3. That means if C3 is sending some messages to the group C2, it will be delayed forever. And same for the messages which are going to be communicated from C2 group to C3 group. And not only that, it starts interacting with the participants in the C2 group with an impression, giving them the impression that the inputs of the participants in this group is zero. Whereas to the other group of participants, it interacts and give them the impression that my input or the inputs of the parties in this group is 1. So now if you closely follow what's happening is, if I see from the viewpoint of C2 group, they will feel as if they are in this execution. 
whereas if you see from the viewpoint of the C3 group, they will feel as if they are in this execution. That means whatever the group C2 would have decided in this execution, the same C2 should do in this execution and whatever C3 has decided in this execution, it should do in this middle invocation and that is what they will do. And what is going to happen is that the parties in C2 will output 0 because that is what they would have done in this execution and the parties in the group C3 will output 1 because that is what they would have done in the last execution. But that is clearly a violation of the agreement property because if indeed pi is a valid agreement proper agreement protocol, it should also provide the agreement property and that shows that you cannot tolerate exactly uh, one third corruption. You need to have one extra party than the one uh, n over 3, right. One more thing I would like to stress here is uh, in my problem description, I assume that the inputs of each party is a bit because that is what was the original formulation of the problem. So, the inputs of all the parties are bit and the final output should also be a bit. That was the that is a requirement from a Byzantine agreement protocol, but in reality the inputs of the parties could be anything, it need not be a bit, it could be a large message, right. So, what we need is a Byzantine agreement protocol where the inputs of the parties are arbitrarily large and we also need arbitrarily large outputs satisfying the validity property and the agreement property. One way of going from the bit version of the agreement to uh, bit agreement problem for any domain is that you invoke a dedicated instance of agreement protocol for each bit of the inputs of the parties. So, if the inputs of the parties are L bits long, then to achieve agreement on L bits, you can run L independent instances of agreement protocol, but that will be uh, too inefficient. There is a very well known line of research in the distributed computing. This is called domain extension. What the domain extension does it, it takes, it makes the assumption that you have agreement protocols available for bit, which provides you. Uh, which, uh, which tells you how to do agreements on bit and using it as a black box, you basically design agreement protocols to deal with uh, messages of larger size and there is a, uh, there are lots of work which has been done here. Uh, very recently, there is a work by Chaya and Arpita who shows how to design uh, domain extension even in the case of dishonest majority and I also had some work in the asynchronous model. So, that means it is safe to assume that we have now agreement protocols where the inputs of the parties are bits because by applying the domain extension protocol, we also get efficient protocols where the inputs of the parties could be arbitrary long inputs. So, that brings me to the end of the first part of the talk where I explained you about, uh, where I explained the uh, problem definition and what are the known results. Now, let us go into the randomized Byzantine agreement. How do we design randomized Byzantine agreement in the asynchronous world? So, <clears throat> This is a common framework of Rebin and Penor. So, what they said is assume you have access to two gadgets, a voting gadget and a common coin gadget. And what this voting gadget does is it is a deterministic protocol. It is an asynchronous protocol having three asynchronous rounds of communication. It is a very simple protocol. The inputs of the parties are bits and the outputs of the parties is also a bit or a bot output, null output. So, if the parties get some output which is a bit, then they also get a confidence in that output. How sure they are that that is the output or whether to take it for further consideration or not. We will very soon see what are the properties, what are the various interpretations of these grades. And basically this vote protocol tries to reach agreement deterministically, which we know is not possible always in the asynchronous domain. But just by doing this three rounds of asynchronous communication, this vote protocol tries to solve the agreement protocol, agreement problem. Whereas this common coin is an ideal functionality, you can imagine that there is some trusted Guruji Maharaj, which is available to the end participants. And if everyone calls that functionality, this functionality basically tosses or samples random bits for the individual parties and gives them to the individual parties. And it is common coin in the sense there is a commonness property uh, which ensures that with probability p sub b, the common bits of all the honest parties will be b. That means even though the functionality is sampling random bits for the parties, with probability p not p0, the bits that that has been sampled for all the honest parties will be 0 with probability p sub 1, the bit sampled for all the honest parties will be 1. That is a commonness property we expect from this functionality. And this framework of Rebin and Benor, what it shows it, it says that 
if this P0 and P1 are constant, say for instance it is 1 over 4, for example, then by combining these two gadgets, the voting gadget and the common coin functionality for expected constant number of times, you get a randomized agreement protocol in the asynchronous setting. So now let us go a little bit deeper into what exactly the voting protocol is and what is the common coin. <clears throat> so as I said, this vote protocol, it is a three round deterministic protocol and uh, the inputs of the parties are some bits and the outputs of the parties could be either 0 or 1 or bot, right? Three possibility out, the three possible output, 0, 1 or bot. And along with that, if the output is some bit, they also get a grade. The grade could be either sure, not sure, sure, not sure. Whereas if the, whereas if the idea is bought, then the grade is no idea. And the requirements from this voting protocol are the following. The first requirement is that if the inputs of all the parties are same in this voting protocol, then it ensures that agreement is achieved. That means it ensures that the output of all the parties will be that bit along with the grade sure and the grade sure you can imagine as if it is an indication that there is an overwhelming majority for that bit in the system. So the vote protocol ensures that if all the honest parties start with the same bit then that will be the final output of the voting protocol and the grade will be sure. The only problematic case could be for the voting protocol is when the inputs of the parties are a mixed bag of inputs. Some have 0, some have 1. In that case, you do not, you may not get a final bit as the outcome. You may get a bot as the output, or you may get the same. Some of the, you may get one of the bits as the output with either a confidence like not sure or no idea. But this voting protocol will ensure that it never happens that the output of two honest parties are complementary bits. That will never happen. If at all the honest parties are outputting bit they will be the same bit but what can go wrong is that if to begin with if all the honest parties have a mixed bag of inputs then some parties may output a bit as the output some parties may output bot as the output that is a problematic case for this voting protocol and this voting protocol is very simple basically the three rounds of communication is the following in the first round everyone just send their inputs to everyone then in the second round I collect n minus n n minus t inputs that other parties have sent to me and I take the majority of it and again I relay it in the system and in the third round I do the same task again. That means I collect n minus t majority votes that everyone has sent to me and I again take a majority of that and send to everyone. And then I perform some decisions based on what I obtained at the first round and what I obtained at the end of the second round. Based on that I determine whether my grade should be sure, not sure, no idea. So believe me, uh, voting protocol has these three properties. Right? So now let us see how we can compose this voting gadget and the common coin gadget to get a randomized agreement protocol. So this protocol will be now an iterative protocol. You can relate it with the do while loop condition that I showed you. So to begin with, these will be the respective in inputs of the parties that they want as the input for the BA protocol. So remember, in the agreement protocol, the inputs of all the parties are bit. So that will be the starting point of all the participants and then they run an instance of a vote protocol with a hope that the instance of the vote protocol helps them to solve the agreement. Now what can happen is if the inputs of the parties is a mixed bag of inputs, then the vote protocol alone is not sufficient to solve the agreement because some may output a bit, some may output a bot. So what they do is independent of vote helped you to do solve the agreement or not, each participant also calls the common coin functionality, right? And say the output of the common coin is R. Remember with probability P0, R will be 0 for all the honest parties. With probability P1, R is 1 for all the honest parties. Now what can happen is there are two possible cases. So the parties who have obtained bot at the end of the vote protocol, they will take the bit which the common coin functionality is giving to them. And now there are two possible cases. If the common coin which the functionality has given to the parties who has obtained bot matches the bit which actually honest parties have taken as the output of the vote protocol, then what it ensures is that all the good parties are on the same page and next time when they run an instance of the vote protocol, agreement will be achieved. But what can go wrong is if the coin that functionality has given to you mismatch the output of the vote protocol that the honest parties have taken 
then again you are in the same situation that you were there at the beginning of this iteration. So that means if to begin with all the good parties have the same bit, just the instance of vote will suffice to solve the agreement. But to begin with, if all of them are on a different page, then some of them will take the output of the vote for the next iteration, some of them will take the output of the coin for the next iteration. And depending upon what is the commonness probability of the uh, coin protocol, in the next iteration, either you will be solving the agreement or you may not be solving the agreement. Right? So what's the probability that you keep on running this iteration for k iteration and still you remain in the condition when at the beginning of each iteration, the parties have a mixed bag of inputs. Well, as we can calculate and as if, if I ensure that probabilities P0 and P1 are constant and after running constant expected number of iteration, you will reach a scenario where at the beginning of the next iteration, the inputs of all the parties will be same and the instance of vote in that instance will solve the agreement problem. So now the question boils down, the vote protocol is a deterministic one, the question boils down that how do we emulate this common coin mechanism, right? So the common coin functionality, there we assume that we have a trusted party where everyone knocks the trusted party and the trusted party samples a bit and give to everyone and with probability P0 and P1, the outputs will be 0 and 1 for the respective parties. So trust is very difficult to emulate because we are in Kali Yuga, we are not in Satyug, right? You can't say that such a trusted functionality is available in the system. So this trusted functionality has to be emulated by running a protocol among the participants. And depending upon whether this instantiation of common coin is one minus lambda terminating or always terminating, this resultant BA protocol becomes one minus lambda terminating or almost surely terminating. That means if your instantiation of common coin has some lambda probability of non-termination and if you are plugging in that instantiation of common coin here, then there is some lambda chance that you do not go to the next iteration and your BA protocol stucks. Whereas if your instantiation of common coin is always terminating and if you plug in that instantiation here, then you will always go on, keep on going to the next iteration. The only case agreement is not achieved is that in each iteration R is different from B. Okay? So that is a very classical framework of uh, Benor and Rebin to plug in vote and coin protocol to get an agreement protocol. Uh, now let us see how we get an instantiation of the coin protocol. So for getting an instantiation of the coin protocol, we need two gadgets. The first gadget is asynchronous reliable broadcast. So broadcast again is a very fundamental problem in distributed computing. Uh, we have a system of n participants and one of them is a des designated entity, say the sender. And there could be up to t corruptions in the system, possibly including the sender. And sender has an input. There is no input for the remaining parties. It's only the sender who has an input for this primitive. Sender has some message m, which it want to consistently broadcast to all the n participants. One simple way of doing that is it can send individually the message to the parties, but that's not sufficient because if the sender is bad, it can send different versions of its message to the different receivers. Or if it is bad, then what it can do is it can send messages only to a subset of parties, may not send it to the other subset of parties and so on. Right? So remember, we assume that sender could also be potentially corrupt in the system. So what we need here is once sender sends some messages to the parties, we need interaction among the parties to verify whether sender has sent a message to us any party or not, whether it has done it consistently or not and so on. So we need some properties from this uh, reliable broadcast primitive. The first property that we need here is the termination property. And what we demand here is if the sender is honest, then we need the guarantee that all the honest parties should eventually terminate with some output. That means it should not happen that honest parties keep on running the protocol forever if sender is honest. But we don't put any condition if the sender is bad, right? That means we need a protocol which should give this guarantee if sender is honest. And we remember we don't know in advance whether sender is going to be honest or not, right? If sender is bad, it does not send a message, fine. It's fine if the protocol keeps on running forever. But if the sender is honest, we need the guarantee that protocol should terminate for everyone eventually. But we also need a guarantee that if sender is bad and some party has terminated with an output, then everyone else should also eventually terminate. 
That means it should not happen that one has got the output, but other has not got the output. That should not happen. So that is a termination property. And we also need an agreement property from this prim sorry, from this primitive. We need the requirement that if all the on if, if at all the honest parties output or terminate the protocol, they should output or terminate with a common output. Right? So here also we need an agreement property and you might be wondering whether this primitive is same as the Byzantine agreement primitive. It turns out that in the synchronous domain agreement and broadcast are equivalent to each other. If you have a protocol for broadcast, you can get a protocol for agreement and vice versa. But in the asynchronous world, these two problems are a different problem because we have a sender dependent termination condition. We need the termination to happen only if sender is honest. It is fine if sender is bad and the protocol keep on running. Whereas in the asynchronous agreement problem, we need termination to eventually happen irrespective of how many participants are good, how many participants are bad. So for this talk, I will take a very simple asynchronous reliable broadcast protocol uh, given by Braca. It is a very simple elegant protocol given by Braca way back in 1984, which solves this reliable asynchronous reliable broadcast uh, problem with T less than N over 3 corruption. And the second primitive which I need for instantiating the common coin uh, is asynchronous verifiable secret sharing or AVSS. This is an extension of verifiable secret sharing in the asynchronous domain. So Professor Pandurangan in the last lecture, he explained secret sharing where there is a secret owner and his goal was to split his secret into shares and give it to the participants. There he assumed that the owner of the secret is performing his task honestly. That means it is picking the polynomial properly computing the shares properly, distributing the shares properly and so on. But this notion of verifiable secret sharing is an extension of secret sharing in the malicious world where we assume that the owner of the secret may not follow the protocol instructions. And this is basically a pair of protocols. So when I say an asynchronous verifiable secret sharing, I mean to say I have a pair of protocols. There will be one protocol for the sharing phase where the secret has to be shared and there will be one protocol for the reconstruction phase. In the sharing phase, we have a designated party or the owner of the secret whom we also call as dealer, denoted as D and we have N shareholders who are supposed to receive their shares P1 to Pn and during this sharing phase, there could be up to T corruptions possibly including the owner of the secret. That means possibly including the dealer D. And dealer has some secret S which it wants to share, split the secret into shares and give the respective shares to the respective shareholders. So you can imagine this whole protocol as if dealer wants to put his secret or his input inside a lock box and give one key for opening that box to each of the individual shareholders. So you can imagine that the key shares are nothing but the keys to open that locked box. Now what are the properties and during the reconstruction phase basically we want that all these n parties should go with their instances of keys or the shares and they should be able to open the box and reconstruct what was kept inside the box. That is what we want during the reconstruction phase and this we want even if there are t bad shareholders who provides incorrect keys or incorrect shares to open the box. That is a property we need during the reconstruction phase. Now, in this AVSS mechanism, we need few properties. So we need again termination, correctness and privacy properties. The termination requirement that we need here is that we need that if the dealer is honest, eventually he should be able to share his secret. That means eventually it should happen that every honest party receives its share. It should not happen that the protocol keeps on running forever. And we also need the requirement that if the dealer is bad and if some honest party has obtained its share, then eventually everyone else should also eventually receive its shares. That means it should not happen that only one good guy got its share, but everyone else is waiting forever. That should not happen. And the third requirement is that assuming sharing phase was done properly, everyone got their shares and now everyone decides that we have to open the locked box. We want to reconstruct a secret, then the reconstruction should eventually terminate. That means it should not happen that reconstruction never happens. So these are the three requirements from the sharing and reconstruction protocol with respect to termination. We need the correctness property. The correctness property is the interesting property when it comes to verifiable secret sharing. What we need here is that if the sharing phase terminates, 
then irrespective of whether dealer is honest or bad, definitely there is some value which has been shared. That guarantee should be given to us. That means in some sense you can imagine that if the sharing phase has terminated, there is some unknown value which dealer has committed by giving the shares of that unknown value to the respective shareholders and that committed value should be the input of the dealer if dealer is honest. That means it should not be an arbitrary value otherwise the problem becomes simple to solve. If there is some arbitrary value then everyone can take a default sharing of zero. What we want is if the dealer is honest then his value should be properly shared but even if there, the dealer is bad there is some value which has been properly shared and only that value should be later reconstructed and the usual privacy property from the verifiable secret sharing scheme that as long as the secret is not reconstructed any collection of tea parties if they pool their shares they should not be able to learn anything about the secret. So these are the properties that I need from verifiable secret sharing. So during my second talk which will be the last talk of the workshop I will be talking about the instantiations of verifiable secret sharing in the asynchronous domain but for the moment assume you have access to such a sharing protocol and a reconstruction protocol with 3t plus 1 and our goal is to instantiate common coin. Remember the requirement of common coin is all the honest parties should output 0 with probability p0 where p0 is known to you it is under your control and with probability p1 all the honest parties should output 1. We are going to instantiate it emulate it assuming I have a verifiable secret sharing gadget and I have a reliable broadcast gadget. So step one, what each party does is PI selects a random element from the field. So I assume I have a field where all the computations are performed. So PI selects a random element from the field for the jth party. It won't tell to the jth party that this is the value that I am picking for you. But on the behalf of the jth party, ith party is going to share a value among all the parties using the instance of the verifiable secret sharing. And this is going to happen for every PI and every J. So that means if I consider the first party, it's going to pick a value say S11 on the behalf of P1 and going to share it. On the behalf of the jth party, it's going to pick a value S1J and going to share it. And on the behalf of the nth party, it's going to pick a value S1N and going to share it. Remember, these values are not known to anyone. It's only known to P1. It is picking those values randomly and sharing it by running, executing the steps of the verifiable secret sharing. Same the ith party is picking a set of n values where the jth value is dedicated for the jth party and sharing it. So like that you, there are n cross n instances of secret sharing which are getting executed here. Now since we are in the asynchronous world, different parties will be terminating different instances of sharing protocol. If we are in the share, if we are in the synchronous world, designing a common coin protocol is very simple. Everyone just share a value and then you add all of them and reconstruct. That's a common thing that everyone will agree upon. But we are in the asynchronous world and different parties will be terminating different instances of sharing protocol, right? And so on. So we have to take care of those technicalities. Step two, what PJ does, and this is what every PJ will do. So PJ, it knows that there are N dealers. Each of them has picked one value for PJ and shared it among the respective parties. Since we are in the asynchronous domain, PJ cannot wait to terminate all those n instances. At the most, it can wait for termination of n minus t of those instances because there could be t bad dealers who may not have started their respective sharing protocol for the party PJ. So what PJ does is it keeps on populating a list of dealers whose sharing instance meant for PJ has been terminated by PJ. And as soon as that list becomes of size t plus 1 that means as soon pj finds that there are okay there are this t plus 1 dealers whose sharing instance i have terminated it populates that set and broadcast it using the bracas reliable protocol remember when it broadcast using bracas reliable protocol the identity of the set cj will go identically to all the respective parties so as and when some party pj identifies a list of t plus 1 dealers it broadcast it and the other parties who receive this set CJ can verify whether this list CJ is a valid list or not. Whether indeed those T plus 1 instances of sharing protocol has been terminated by PJ or not. Why? 
because remember the termination property of VSS is that if PJ has terminated those sharing instances, everyone else should also eventually terminate those instances. That means if PJ is saying publicly that these are the T plus 1 instances I have terminated, everyone else can also verify the same. So the first claim that I make here is that if indeed a valid CJ is broadcasted in the system, then there is some value which I say coin J associated with the party PJ which PJ is not aware but that value is randomly chosen from the field. And this is because if I take the list CJ, it is actually a collection of T plus 1 dealers each of whom has picked one value for PJ and shared it. So imagine for instance the list CJ has the first T plus 1 parties that means the first party has picked a value for CJ and shared it, the second party has picked a value for PJ and shared it. Like that there are T plus 1 parties. If I take the summation of the values that those parties have picked for PJ and shared, then my claim is that the summation of the value which I denote as coin J is also a random element from the field and this is because there exists at least one dealer in this collection of T plus 1 dealers whose sharing instances PJ has terminated. So even though the T bad, there could be T potentially bad dealers who may not have picked random values for PJ, but there exists at least one good dealer in this collection of T plus 1 dealers whose value will be random and hence the summation of the values will be random. Remember the value of the coin J at this moment is not known to PJ because every computation is happening on shared values. Now comes the crux of this uh, common coin instantiation. What each PI is going to do is, it's going to maintain a list of coins and keep on populating. That means as and when it learns that some party has broadcasted it lists, its, its list of T plus 1 dealers, it includes it in list of coin set. So it keeps on populating its coin set as and when it comes. And in the same way other parties are also keep on populating their respective coin set. That means as and when they receive a collection of T plus 1 dealers validated, include it in a list S. Again a next set of T plus 1 dealers come, if that's valid, include in the S list and so on. Now the parties after maintaining this list of coin sets interact with each other in the same way the interaction happens in the voting protocol and that interaction ensures the following. So I am not going to go into the details of that interaction but that's basically because that's complex to explain but that's what constitute the crux of this instantiation that interaction ensures that eventually the list of coins that each party has collected becomes of size n minus t and magically there will be a common unknown subset of size m which will be present across the coin set of all the parties and that constitutes the crux of this common coin instantiation. So that means if I am PI and if I am populating my list of coins which I have validated and in the same way if there is a party PJ who is validate, who is maintaining a list of coins and validating it and there will be a three rounds of asynchronous communication, it will be ensured that my list of coins and PJ's list of coins will have an overlap of n over 3. So once this asynchronous communication happens and once my list of coins becomes of size n minus t, what I am going to do is I am going to announce my list of coins which I have validated and as soon as everyone else verifies that my list of coins is of size n minus t, we will start reconstructing those coins and for reconstructing those coins we have to run the corresponding reconstruction instances of the verifiable secret sharing protocol. So for instance if I take the ith party, his first coin is cp which it wants to reconstruct. How it can reconstruct? CP is defined by a list of T plus 1 dealers, each of whom has selected a value and shared on the behalf of the pth party. We have to basically run the corresponding rec instances and once we run, run the rec instances, we learn the pth coin, namely the coin which has been associated with the party P. In the same way, I go to the next coin CQ. CQ is determined by a list of T plus 1 dealers run those reconstruction instances and add those values, you get the qth coin and so on. Now once the coin values are reconstructed, they are reduced modulo u where u is some 0.87n. Uh, this 0.7n I am taking because my final goal is to get a common coin where the success probabilities should be 1 over 4, 1 over 4. 
if you want a better success probability or whatever probability is P0 or P1 you want, you can decide this value of u. But assuming we want P0 and P1 to be 1 over 4, once all these coins are revealed, you reduce them modulo u and obtain a value in the range 0 to u minus 1, right? And the claim is that this final reduced value that you are associating with the pth party will be a uniformly random value in the range 0 to u minus 1 because the corresponding field element was a random element in the range in, in the field. So when you are reducing a random field element modulo u, you get a value in the range 0 to u minus 1. Now how the ith party is going to decide its final output bit because remember we have to design a coin protocol where the output of each party should be a bit. Right now pi has a list of n minus t coin values each of them which are random in the range 0 to u minus 1, it has to take a decision whether its final output should be 0 or whether its final output should be 1. So its decision is very simple, out of the n minus t coins that it has reconstructed, it checks whether if any of those coin value is 0, if any of those coin value is 0, it set its final output to 0, otherwise it set its final output to 1. And the same decision pj is going to do, pk is going to do and so remember. So pj will also have a list of n minus t coins, each of them will be reduced modulo u and if any of those coins is 0, its output will be 0, otherwise the output will be 1 and so on. So now let us calculate the commonness probability, what is the probability that all honest parties will output 0. So remember I said that my list of coin values, other parties list of coin values will have an overlap of n over 3 and if any of the coin values in that overlap is 0, then it turns out that everyone will output 0. So the probability that all the output zero, all the honest parties output 0 is we calculate what is the probability that this common intersection of coins that is guaranteed to exist across all the parties have no val coin value being 0. The probability of that is the prob because coin value 0 can occur with probability 1 over u, you want a guarantee that none of these coin values across the common intersection is 0, that probability is this, you subtract. And since I have set my value of u to be 0.87n and my m, the common intersection is supposed to be n over 3, for any n greater than 3, for, for this value of u, we get this probability to be 0 0.25. On the other hand, what is the probability that all honest parties output 1? Well, in case if none of the coin values which are obtained after reducing modulo u is 0, then definitely all the honest parties will output 1 because that is the decision. The decision for outputting 1 is if the final modulo u reduced value none of them is 0. So what is the probability that none of the modulo u reduced value in the system is 0? The probability of that is this again based on the value of u that I have selected it turns out to be 0 0.25. So what this shows is that if you have a verifiable secret sharing protocol then by plugging in with a reliable broadcast protocol you can get an instantiation of common coin. So that brings me to the end of the second part of the talk. I am more or less done. Uh, conclude with, we discussed about uh, asynchronous Byzantine agreement problem. Uh, this is a fundamental problem in secure distributed computing. Uh, there are plenty of challenging open problems. Uh, some of them I would like to mention here. For others, you can uh, listen to my second talk. So this, uh, we have problems related to improving the communication complexity. So if we take the classical work of Kennedy and Rabin way back in 93, their communication complexity was of order n power 11. Uh, we have made it right now n power 5. It is a big problem to, a big open problem to further improve the communication complexity because in the computational world, it is very easy to instantiate a common coin. A simple instantiation of common coin in the computational world where adversary is computationally bounded is, you assume you have a threshold signature setup. To generate a common bit, what you do is you randomly sign a value and take the using a threshold signature scheme and take the LSB or MSB of that signature. With high probability that signature was unpredictable, hence if you are in the random oracle model and if your signature scheme is secure, the LSB or the MSB of the signature will be indeed 0 or 1 with equal probability. So that is a very simple instantiation in the cryptographic world. We are interested in the instantiation of common coin in the information theoretic setting where adversary is computationally unbounded. Another open problem is we do not know any good protocols in the full information model. 
So the protocol that I discussed is in the point to point channel setting where we assume that every pair of party is connected by a pair wise secure channel. In the full information model we assume that every communication is known to the adversary that means adversary could even see the messages which are exchanged between the honest pair of parties. What is not known to the adversary is the future coin tosses which honest parties are going to generate that is called as a full information of the broadcast model and designing protocols in the asynchronous world and in the full information model with good efficiency is a really really challenging open problem. Uh, some advertisement uh, from my side. So I am offering this uh, NPTEL MOOC course on foundations of cryptography. It will go live uh, during the end of this month. It is a 32 hour course, video contents are available. Um, and you also have a provision for certificate if you pass the exam. And I extensively coverage introduction to modern cryptography by Cards and Lindell. So I almost cover each and every chapter of that book except the advanced chapters. So if you want a video supplementary material for that book, I recommend you to take this course. The course is divided into two parts. Uh, first half is on symmetric e-crypto, the second half is on the public e-crypto and we also have few weeks of contents on advanced talks. And thank you. Any questions? For yeah, so we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Are there questions? Are, are there any questions? So the, basically the protocol vote plus common coin uh, actually, the, what is the common coin? It's uh, how it's different from the let's say I have shared random bits, or let, like let's say you have a global random coin generation. Hmm. Uh, it's uh, how it's but different it, that common okay, coin. So we do not want it to be predictable. If you if you have a global coin generation mechanism, then even the adversary will be knowing what's the next bit of output which is going to come out. So it can then influence the protocol when you are plugging the vote and the coin. So if it already knows what is the next iteration of coin is going to generate, then it can schedule the messages in the vote protocol so that the output of vote is always different from the output of coin. So one requirement from this coin functionality is that until and unless it output is determined, adversary is not aware what is the output which is going to come out of that coin protocol. But if we have a global coin generation mechanism, then even adversary is known what is the output of the next invocations of the coin protocol. Uh, okay, and if you would say restrict that uh, you only given it's not to the adversarial control. So that's how we do using the verifiable secret sharing. So it's like saying the following: everyone shares some values. Adversary don't know what the good parties are sharing behalf of the other parties, and only after you ensure that certain number of values have been shared in the system, you go and open the system. So basically, you are forcing the parties to commit certain number of values. Adversary don't know what the good parties have com com committed in that bunch. And once that bunch is fixed, then only you go and open that bunch. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So one last thing. So what are the la latest results like uh, in a synchronous uh, setting? So, as I said, you have in the information theoretic setting, we have the protocol by Kennedy Rubin that was in 93, uh, but uh, we improved the protocols to a order n power four uh, by me and Arpita. Uh, that's in the information theoretic setting. If you are in the computational model where cryptography is allowed and adversary is computationally bounded, then there are tons of work by Abraham et al, Dolev et al, uh, which whose complexity of order n square. So basically they end up giving you asynchronous Paxos, asynchronous version of Paxos, which is highly scalable. And are all the considered like complete network? Like yes, one all of them are in the complete network. Mm -hmm. And we do not know anything in the, anything in the sense we do not have good protocols in the full information model. So in all these uh, protocols, we assume that we have a uh, secure channel between every pair of parties. But in the full information model, adversary knows everything, every message which has been communicated in the system. So designing protocols in that model is very, very challenging. In part one, uh, you talked about crash failures, right? Uh, once that is crashed, it remains crashed. Yes. So what if at, after some point of time it comes, it can come alive? That's then a results, different model. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's called omission model. I don't, 
that's obviously weaker than the Byzantine model. Yeah. But whatever impossibility results you have in the crash model, those impossibility results, of course, carry over to the omission model because an omission adversary can always decide that I won't go live again. Okay. So if a protocol is impossible in the presence of crash fault, of course, it's impossible to achieve termination even in the presence of omission fault. Uh, but uh, these results, uh, I mean, there will be some results in, strictly in between crash failures and uh, mm, no. I am not aware of. But the impossi but FLP impossibility there. result, it will be of course yeah, that, that, that will sure, be true even yeah. in the omission model. Whether you can get efficient protocols, I don't know. But uh, there is uh, there is I, no literature. Uh, uh, I am not aware of. Okay. I am not sure. Thank you. Sir, while explaining uh, the necessity f uh, for t less than n by 3, you uh, took like three systems, right, of three, t parties. Three possible invocations, yes. Uh, of uh, t parties product. each. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but it's n by 3 bec because you took uh, three of those, right? Yeah, so I am assuming that I have a protocol with n equal to 3t, which should not be possible. Because when I say protocol is not possible, tolerating more than n over 3 corruption that means you can have at most t less than n over 3 but I am assuming t equal to n over 3 and okay. I am showing a contradiction okay. so t equal to n over 3 means n is equal to 3 t and I have t partitions of t uh, three parties parties uh, partitions of the t components okay thank you any other question So, can you repeat uh, the termination and composition thing? So, how does how do termination and composition go? So composition means I am talking about UC composition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a difficult question to answer. So, I don't know the results respect to the. So, because there was you used gadgets and compost. Ah, so basically, in each iteration, there is a sequential invocation. So, we have an instance of vote protocol, and after that, we have an instance of uh, coin protocol. So, in the information theoretic setting, we can actually formally prove that uh, the results of composition hold meant that means uh, adversary cannot influence the output of the vote protocol with the output of the coin protocol. Okay, so let us uh, close the session before lunch. So, we will be heading to a different venue as I have mentioned and you need to follow uh, all the uh, bunch of people in black. Uh, not. So okay. So just can you uh, raise? Your, uh, can you stand up? Yeah. So these are the people you should follow. Okay, they're all in black, <laughs> and they will take you to the. Uh, uh, one second. I, we have a small token of appreciation for the speaker, which I'm forgetting. Okay. <laughs>